we will go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. We, again, we're so excited to have you all here for our 2022 landscape analysis and grant details. We are honored to be working in this space with each of you, so many of you on a daily basis. And so we just consider this a next step in our work together, um, but it's the fun part. It's the part that we get to give you money. <laughs> so this is the part that we're not just cheering you along or working alongside you, but we get to encourage you in a different way and in a financial way as you are um, continuing the work of serving survivors. So just to give you an idea of what our next time together is going to look like, I will begin with a Safe House Project overview. You will have a restorative care breakdown that all of the uh, data uh, analysis is going to come from Brittany Dunn, who is my COO and co-founder. So she'll be going over res the restorative care breakdown across the nation, barriers to equitable access to care for survivors. We will see the 2022 Safe House Project grant details from Alia DeWeese, and we will hear from a couple of our 2021 grant recipients who are just getting ready to open their homes or have already opened. And then I will give one quick overview that's a little bit of a housekeeping item, but I really hope you guys can be part of that. So this is for the Tra Trafficking Survivor Equity Coalition that we really believe that each of you have a voice in and would love to see you join us in this. So to get started, for those of you who don't know us, I know there's, like I said, a lot of folks on here that do, but as much as it's important to us that you understand what Safe House Project does, it's really important to us that you understand just our hearts and where we come from in serving in this work. Brittany and I co-founded this organization in 2017. Both of us came from varying backgrounds in corporate America and we're both military spouses. And neither of us was looking to really leave what we were doing and step into this space. Stories that I'm sure I know sound like many of you. I was going one way and then I was going another. We were responding to support a need to build a safe house in South Africa. And as we began doing that, people started to say, that's great, but what are you going to do here? And we didn't know, so we decided to become students of the industry and discovered what many of down to your toes eat, sleep, and breathe every day, that uh, the trafficking numbers in the United States were horrific, that the percentage of those being identified was even more horrific, around 1%. We recognized really that without a safe place to go, 80% of those who were being victimized ended up back in traffickers' hands. We recognized what quality restorative care looked like. And we recognized that at that point in 2017, there were reports of only about 100 beds in safe houses across America. And so our organization launched to do two, three, two things, or now three. We work to increase victim identification through education. Uh, so to date, we've trained over 200,000 people through our different training solutions, including OnWatch, which is our free community-based training. A lot of the organizations on here have used it to train volunteers to baseline then and understanding not just human trafficking, but the stories and the, the faces behind it. We help survivors escape their trafficking situation and get them placed into restorative care. So we are not one of the national placement agencies, but we do placements. I think we've probably done five this week. Again, helping survivors escape, get them into the restorative care that they need, and then walk with them on that journey. That is the deepest honor. It's the one thing I swore up, down, left, and center we wouldn't do, and you could not take it away from me. It's something that I'm, I have calls that just came in for another placement. So I'm going to be calling some of you to see who can help. But the other thing is that the dollars that we raise, our vast majority go to you all. We intend to help fund mentor, launch new safe homes across America because we know survivors need them. We know there are incredible programs that are boots on the ground working every day on behalf of survivors and they would do more if there were resources available. And our heartbeat is to be those resources, to come alongside you all, to make sure that you get what you need to help expand capacity or decrease barriers to care. So we are really grateful for all of you. I think to date, not, I think, I know that to date we have helped support um, the launch of 272 new beds through newer expanding safe homes across America. Last year, we dispersed about 333,000. It's been really cool to see. I think our first year it was 80,000, then 160, then last year about 333,000. But this year we are making a commitment to disperse $500,000 out to you all. Again, 
it is with the intent to help to serve and to see capacity expand. So I am grateful that we get to be in this work with you all. I'm grateful that each of you has the heart to serve survivors. And so now I am going to turn it over to Brittany who can share more about the data that's been collected and how we hope it can be used to inspire you, to encourage you, to help you understand areas that we see opportunities for growth. And maybe we can all come along together and partner in filling some of those gaps. So Brittany, I'll turn it over to you. Wonderful. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. What Christy didn't tell you is really, I'm just the data nerd in our group. My background is in international business development and strategic growth. So I am a numbers person from when we launched to now, I um, really intend and try to steward our um, internal resources as well as equip others in the industry with the data that they need to make um, informed decisions. And so that's just a little bit about who I am and why I get to be the one presenting to you all today. So as we start, I think that it's always important for us to be in a cycle of innovation or improvement. And that really comes from identifying gaps, making a plan, executing on that plan, and then reviewing the data that has come in. So as we kind of um, work through the data today and uh, we give you an overview of what we're seeing in the restorative care space, our hope is for you to also sit there and think through what are your core competencies that can be as an individual, that can be as an agency and organization, but really trying to think through of where your strengths are because we all need to use our strengths for service. The next part is how do you need to partner to provide more successful outcomes for survivors? Think on how do you need to refine your program to improve? What data do you need to collect to inform your decisions? And then what are strategic intentional growth opportunities for your organization that you could explore? The other thing that I want to make sure that we come to the table with is, as Christy mentioned, we're both military wives. So my husband is a naval aviator. And in the world of naval aviation, there are different aircrafts with different jobs. So there are some that are very strategic for a, a jet that is going to do air-to-air -air combat versus my husband, who's a helicopter pilot. So his core competency is the insertion of our special forces into a conflict. And so what that just reminds me of when we talk about the trafficking space is that we need a variety of types of organizations because survivors don't look one way, because the needs of individuals don't look one way, and because we all have a different part to play. But when we all are using our core competencies and using our strengths for service, we become a giant aircraft carrier of organizations, of support systems to help equip survivors in their path through restorative care. And I really encourage you to think on that and maybe evaluate how you feel like your organization is doing at that core mission. How are they contributing to the greater mission of the anti-trafficking industry and any adjustments that may need to be made based on that evaluation, honestly. I think that also what that helps highlight is that we all need to be working together in order for us to really achieve that overall mission of eradicating trafficking and providing equitable access to care for survivors of trafficking. Data is something that, as I said, I adore because it helps inform decisions, but I also want to make sure that where our data is coming from, that you feel like there aren't any questions around the data, but we'll also acknowledge that human trafficking is an illegal industry, data is limited, and there are parts of the framework that are still being developed. And so some of this, will the data will rely on what is available versus some other applications, which is using the Safe House Project grant and certification data, surveys, partner data, industry studies, or open source information. And then all of this is underpinned by our lived experience consultants or staff who is providing feedback on the efficacy of that data if they feel like it is representative of what they're seeing and really trying to marry lived experience and marry the qualitative and the quantitative data together to give you all an overview of where we're seeing the restorative landscape in 2022. Through our analysis, we have identified 357 nonprofit organizations that are serving trafficking survivors in the United States in direct care. This does not represent the government agencies or task forces or coalitions. It's really those individual entities. The Of those 357 organizations, 272 
are providing residential housing to survivors. 35 are in the process of launching a residential program and 76 are or non-residential community-based services like case management, drop-in centers, et cetera. The map will show the human trafficking program density by state. There are still some states that do not have any services that are specific to victims of trafficking. So that is a big number. And I think that are 272 residential programs. We often hear that I'm the only one doing this in my state. We have made a lot of progress, <clears throat> excuse me, in the past 20 years since the original TVPA was passed in 2000 to where we're at today. And there are a lot of organizations that are in this space serving survivors well through a variety of models. For the purpose of this analysis, we are really honing in on those who offer restorative housing and are meeting somewhere along the continuum of care. So the National Library of Medicine defines the continuum of care as an integrated system that guides and tracks tra trafficking survivors over time through comprehensive services spanning all levels of intensity of care. So emergency placement, that's up to 90 days. Some programs can be broken out, obviously, more into a, an emergency and then assessment, but that is this entire category. We have long-term programs, which are 12 to 18 month holistic programs, and then transitional programs, which on average are six to 12 months. So of that 272 programs, we find that about 140 of them are serving young adults or adults through residential care. 75 are providing emergency services and 46 are providing transitional services. 28 are for mothers and their children. And then 74 of those are going to serve domestic minor sex trafficking survivors through residential care. And I should also note that if you have questions along the way, we definitely want to have you put those in the chat. So feel free to add those in as you see fit. If we have time, we can take questions at the end. Otherwise, we will respond to those through email after the webinar. Alrighty, so this is the number 13,594. We're going to use this a little bit throughout the analysis today because it represents the number of calls received from survivors by the National Human Trafficking Hotline in 2020. Obviously, we all know this is not representative of every single survivor touch point by nonprofit organizations, government agencies, other hotlines, whether that's state, local, or other national hotlines. But in order to help ground us on a centralized number, we are going to use the hotline data for the purpose of this analysis. So if we use that 13,000 number and we understand that most restorative care homes have an average of six beds and we extrapolate out that 272 number, there are roughly 1,632 beds in restorative care homes across the United States. I know that there are some programs that are launching with many more beds than what we have traditionally seen. And so that average is being pulled up. And so we are seeing capacity grow from where we were even just in 2017 when Safe House Project launched, and there was only around 1,100 beds. But I think we also acknowledge that throughout COVID, we did see programs close and some refine maybe programs that had expanded out their services, whether that was a sheltering model to serve victims of human trafficking, may have scaled that back during COVID as well. So this is a rough estimate of the number of beds that we believe are um, throughout the United States. So if we use that number and then work through the number of survivors who reached out to the hotline, that means that 87.9% of survivors will not have access to residential care. That number, of course, is, is a good working framework. I'm not going to say that is the absolute number of survivors that do not have access because we all know that there are turnover in the restorative care homes. There are survivors who aren't seeking to enter a residential program. And then of course, we know that 13,000 number is higher when we would aggregate all resources which is a dream of mine one day, I'm just going to say, it'd be fantastic if we had a centralized reporting system for all human trafficking data in the United States. But until then, working with these numbers. So it also should be noted that a survivor entering an emergency program and moving through the continuum of care will spend approximately two to three years in a residential program. So considering that only 140 of those 272 programs were serving adult victims of trafficking, then in long term, that 272 isn't even comprehensive, meeting 
they can't meet the needs of all survivors just by the nature of that. So I think this is at least good for us to recognize that we need more organizations in this space. And I know sometimes there's a spirit of competition within the nonprofit sector, but I think there's also that acknowledgement that I love when we see programs collaborating and partnering to promote the uh, maybe different model of another program that's entering into their region because not all survivors have the same needs and they might prefer a program who does something slightly different based on their trauma history as opposed to another program. And so there is as much growth as we've seen happen, there's exponentially more growth needed in order to really meet the individualized needs of our survivors. So transitioning over to more barriers to equitable care for trafficking survivors, these were, this has really come through a variety of sources, whether it's the National Human Trafficking Hotline, other hotlines, referral agencies, saying these are the barriers that we're finding. I know we, a safe house project, having placed 250 survivors, have been met with multiple of these barriers while trying to assess the best program with survivors that they would like to move into. And so we're going to break this down a little bit through some data and hit a little bit on each of these. So to start, let's talk about referrals and disqualifiers for intake. I think what was interesting through our survey of organizations is that it's so fantastic to see that organizations are really relying on their referral network to be or to be comprised of relationships. They are receiving those referrals from the mental health providers in their community. They're establishing really strong rapport with law enforcement and advocacy centers or working with local area hospital systems and court systems to establish pathways for referring individuals into their programs. And so what that is, what we do is each time those relationships and bridges are build, it, built into our community partners, we are decreasing the time that it takes to place a survivor. So what I know that we have seen internally from our side is as each of you has worked so hard to strengthen your community-based referral systems, that the survivors that are buckling up to that national level for help for placement tend to represent more those who are fall into those barriers to care. And so that's also creating very much intentionality around trying to serve survivors at the best, in the best way possible for meeting their individualized needs. The other side of this, though, is the disqualifiers, those same programs that kind of answered where they're re receiving their highest percentage of referrals from, also specified what are their current disqualifiers during intake. As we can see very quickly from the graph, severe mental health and severe physical challenges, health challenges are the biggest barriers to care. Of course, these are going to differ drastically whether or not we are dealing with a program who is in an emergency, is an emergency program long-term versus transitional. And there are different barriers that are established at each of those levels of the continuum of care to make sure that survivor is ready to step into that next part of the continuum. So we will be looking at that, but keep that in mind as we just move through uh, maybe what are some of the challenges that are preventing survivors from having equitable access to care today. So these two we know are not new. And so we're not <laughs> telling you anything you don't know, but I think it's important for us to continually reevaluate the data, to continually come back to saying, okay, have we made improvement or is there still massive barriers? Or on the other side, has this shifted at all? And should our response to these barriers adjust in any way? Today, 18 states still do not have a program to serve minors. When we broke down the number of survivor contacts, according to the Counter Trafficking Data Collaborative, which aggregates data from a variety of sources, looking at just individuals who have been identified in the United States there in 2019, 5,800 of them approximately were, or sorry, in 2020, 5,800 of them approximately were minors. Uh, and so if we look at that, there were 74 um, programs in the United States that can serve minors in some capacity. That means that there's approximately 444 beds for minors. So in looking at that, we know that there are only 7.5% of DMST survivors that are receiving restorative care. That doesn't mean that they're being prevented housing through other options like their therapeutic foster care or more community-based services or other things, 
but this is where there's a limitation on those restorative care beds for this population. And so our hope is that maybe some of this data can also help inform you as you're writing grants and writing those benefit cases to foundations, to funding entities, or articulating the value of your organization to your donors that you can show the progress we made, that, but there, there's still a significant gap here. Um, also a huge issue is obviously the lack of housing for male survivors. I think what was interesting about this though is pulling the thread a little bit through the data collected by the hotline is that we do have a disproportionate number of male survivors who are labor trafficked versus sex trafficked. But when you look at minor victims, minor male victims of trafficking, you will see that kind of swings the other direction and 60% of the minor males were um, sex trafficked. And as you consider, if you are working towards opening a home for adult males versus minor male survivors, your profile of what trauma or therapeutic services and that education profile may look different if you are going to be serving male survivors of labor trafficking because that's a greater need than if you step into housing minor male victims of sex trafficking. We also see significant overlap between the sex and labor that they've experienced both sex and labor trafficking for males. Of the survivors who chose to identify their country of origin or their citizenship out of that 2,644 males, only 62 of, 62 of them identified as a U.S. citizen. That is probably just very underreported, but I think that the other thing that we also have to keep in mind is that we are going to continue to see a greater propensity of non-English speaking survivors and undocumented individuals. And so just keeping that in mind with your funding models, or if you're receiving, if you're able to receive those individuals, that is a core competency that we're desperately needing to highlight in the industry so that we can decrease referrals to your organization or decrease the time that it takes a referral to get to your organization. If they're a survivor, it falls under more of this profile. I also want to acknowledge that right now the transgender data is too limited. I would feel like I wasn't, there, there isn't a lot of um, data out there. So it's really hard to analyze and get to a point where I feel comfortable um, just guessing at this point, but we all can acknowledge, I think that there is massive lack of services for our transgender individuals. Okay, so now we're gonna look at drugs, mother, children, and health care barriers. The hotlines report that 45% of survivors who call the hotline acknowledge active drug use. I think we probably see it higher on an anecdotal basis, but that is one, one data point. But on the other side of that, we have 52% of programs disqualifying based on addiction. And so you're starting to see that when we have programs that are disqualifying on the things that our survivors are exiting their trafficking situation with, it creates additional barriers to offering survivor services. We also saw that out of the 56 programs that applied last year of the ones that are looking to open emergency programs, only 9% plan to offer detox. So there is an opportunity here to strengthen our relationships with healthcare systems or figure out how, or not figure out how, get training on how to do medical detox as part of your programming. As mentioned in the, uh, on a few slides ago, we only have 28 uh, mother-child homes throughout the United States. The average resident or residential program for mother baby is three to four survivors at a time with one to two children. There's also limitations often on the age of the child. So we have some programs that they can accept a child under the age of two. Some will accept pregnant individuals, but then they have to find a new program once they've had the child, or maybe they can stay there through infancy. We, there are a few programs that will allow for mothers to come into children, come in with children, but they only accept children that are prepubescent under the age of eight often for male children. So just something to keep in consideration. Uh, some of the benefits we have seen though is some innovative solutions coming through that where people or programs are starting to partner with other community-based organizations to figure out how to safely house children for any duration that a mother might want to go through a restorative care program 
knowing that her children are being safely housed. Physical disabilities and other health concerns. We do know that trafficking obviously affects anybody of any age, race, socioeconomic class, as well as anybody who has disabilities. And that is not limited based on any other pre-existing conditions they might have. And when survivors come into care that have cancer or have other chronic illness, we have to determine as programs whether or not we're equipped to meet those needs. And if we're not, it's sometimes that hard decision, but in order for us to really make sure that we're providing equity of services to individuals with physical disabilities or other health concerns, we need to build programs that have that ADA compliance built in or have additional staffing for those increased appointments or whatever else it might be within making the house more conducive to, of an environment to meet the needs of those individuals. Otherwise, it's helpful to know who your referring agencies are, who are uniquely qualified to meet the needs of, this, of these survivors and really help establish a clean handoff of this, like really walk the survivor through <coughs> that navigation between resources. So in terms of where the safe house programs are today, we find that less than 50% of programs provide psychiatric services to survivors. Around 68% provide medical, and then around 60% provide dental. And so there definitely are opportunities here to continue to expand programming for the health services that are provided so that we can more appropriately meet the needs of the residents. Mental health. This is a big one, and we know that, and we know it's been one that's become even more significant through COVID. We have definitely seen a rise in individuals coming in with severe mental health disorders, varying levels of psychosis, and I think what is really important in this slide to note is that the studies have shown, whether it's the Loyola studies or others, that on average, a survivor has 10 and a half psychological challenges or disorders, and so we, we have the opportunity to really, you know, partner with the mental health community and with other healthcare agencies to provide best in care to the individuals who are struggling with maybe some of these more severe mental health disorders. There, when we analyzed the data though, we have seen, and I'll get to that in a minute, focusing in though on dissociative identity disorder. Right now, dissociative identity disorder is caused by, or not right now, it is caused by severe repeated and prolonged physical, sexual, and emotional abuse in childhood, but overlay that with the fact that 45% of minor trafficking victims are being trafficked by a family member. There is definitely a link that is being noticed between those minors trafficked by familial members and the presence of dissociative identity disorder. And so there are a lot of different ways to help programs feel more equipped and trained up to address this specific need. And so if that's something that you are interested in, we have had the opportunity to walk alongside a lot of survivors with DID and are happy to share our learnings as well as other community-based or industry experts information who can really help your program respond to this particular need within the industry. The other part of this, though, is I think helping um, us understand that misdiagnosis is still a problem within the overall landscape of mental health, specifically for survivors of trafficking and accurately or partnering or finding having a psychiatrist is really helpful to performing the proper psychiatric evaluations in order to properly diagnose survivors. And then you're going to feel um, like you can provide the best information to the survivor for them to make an informed decision about maybe what long-term restorative program is best suited to serve their particular diagnosis. With that, though, we are we did notice a trend in the data that 13% of programs do not have trauma-informed therapeutic modalities being used. Most 39% of programs use one modality and only 48% use multiple modalities. So if you are a program that is going to expand or wants to expand to more effectively serve those with severe mental health, do understand that there are treatment recommendations based on the health the diagnosis. And so it's making adjustments in your programming to step into this. It also usually demands a um, therapy schedule that is greater than once a week initially. So we just, this is a perfect model analysis. This is not, um, 
meant to um, do, it's not meant to be 100% accurate of the industry because it is a perfect model, but we want to show you how barriers to care lead to open beds in long-term safe house programs, because we often get that question. We have all these individuals who need services, but there's still open beds. Why is that happening? There's a variety of reasons, but let's focus in on how barriers to care are going to lead to open beds. So this model assumes that there are 100 beds available in programs at, at the emergency stage and at the long-term program stage. Of the, of the survivors who, re, who participated in the Leola study, 63% experienced dissociative disorders. And so when we have, as we saw in the disqualifiers for intake, 74% of programs disqualifying um, at different levels on, the, on severe mental health, that can cause challenges to getting survivors through the continuum of care. So, in, so through this model, if you have the emergency programs, which breaking that 74% down, 50% of them would accept survivors with severe mental health challenges, meaning that when you have 100 survivors coming in and 63 of them are identifying with severe mental health challenges, and the emergency program can only accept 50%, that means that 50 survivors with severe mental health challenges will enter that emergency program. But of the other 50 beds, only 37 of those will be filled with this, those without severe mental health challenges. So this isn't considering that obviously, yes, we would backfill and programs will backfill with other survivors. This is just focusing in on 100 beds and 100 individuals. So that at the end of this, the emergency phase, we would have 13 survivors with severe mental health challenges that have been denied care. And with the working knowledge that 80% of survivors who do not have access to safe housing end up being re-victimized, that means 10 of those 13 survivors will end up being re-victimized and we will have 13 beds open as an industry. When we move into the long-term side of this, 24% of long-term residential programs will accept survivors with severe mental health challenges. So of those 50 survivors who entered into an emergency program, only 24 of them will be able to find placement into a long-term restorative care home. The 37 that did not have mental health challenges would be able to also come to that long-term program. But the 26 survivors who entered into emergency would be left without a safe place to go at the end of that program, potentially. And so you have an additional 21 survivors that would represent the 80% being re-victimized and five who are in the community piecing together services that may or may not help them achieve the outcomes that they want for their life. And ultimately what that means for us as an industry is that only 61, our flow rate through emergency and long-term would be 61 survivors receiving emergency and long-term residential care. Collectively between the two phases, 30 to 31 survivors would end up being re-victimized. And 39 beds in long-term restorative care homes would remain vacant despite capacity issues that we all experience. The other part of this model is that it really doesn't take into account comorbidity, system breakdowns, regional barriers, legal requirements, or un other individualized care needs. And I think that we can all acknowledge that we have some work to do, but that's also great because that means that there's areas for improvement. There's ways that we can assess and then reassess where our programs can expand to or new programs coming in can hopefully feel equipped with the information they need to make informed decisions around how to architect programs that will serve survivors across the spectrum and really allow for equitable access to care. So we think that just some of the takeaway points that we felt like as an organization that we saw were opportunities to increase survivor access comes through intentional building of programs that decre decrease barriers to care and increase equitable access to services. I've said that a lot, but one variation of this can be low barrier, safe therapeutic emergency programs with the ability to provide detox or perform psychiatric evaluations or identify individualized needs of survivors. We know there are great emergency programs out there, but we also all know there's just not enough of them. So that's a huge opportunity. Expansion of services within existing programs. 
we have some unbelievable programs in this country that are extremely strong already, whether that holistically, they're very strong qualified programs. And it's, are, is the step for you to take that next that next step into really training and equipping part of your programming to meet one of the barriers that was outlined here today. And then there's innovative solutions, training up safe families to care for survivors' children while they go through a program. Therapeutic foster care has been attempted and piloted in some states, but it isn't well done yet anywhere to where it's being replicated consistently throughout our country. There's other, I know there's tons of other organizations that are working to really test and approve new models. And so it's really exciting to be part of watching new organizations enter in, new blood come into this and seeing just the opportunities for partnership and collaboration to continue to push towards being able to serve that 87.9% of survivors who maybe aren't receiving the opportunity to enter into residential services today. So with that, I just want to thank you for your time. I promised my team that even though I could talk about this probably all day, that I would limit mine to my allotted time, which I think I've done. So I will have Alia come on to discuss the grant details. Thank you, Brittany. Hi, everyone. Excuse me for being off camera. I am not feeling too hot today, but it's been just amazing to get to do this webinar series with you guys and just grateful that you got to see a little more about what we do and the information that we've gathered. And it's never the heart um, of our organization to pose a bunch of problems and then um, not follow up with any solutions. And so a big part of why um, we wanted to, you know, get this data to you was to understand where we're going with our grant application or where our grant applicants this year. And so our internal motto has always been find the gaps, fund the gaps, right? While we're seeing a lot of these, these barriers to care, we know that I know through my conversations with so many of you that you guys are seeing these problems also, and that so many of you are already responding to these issues within, within trying to serve the survivors that are coming to your doors as the best possible way that you can. And with that, we ha are going to be opening up our grant application May 1st of this year. So in, in just a little on Sunday, it'll open up. So Brittany, can you go to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. And with that, a little bit of information, I won't spend much time here, just a little bit of information on what our grant analysis was for last year and how we're growing it this year. And so something that we're changing this year is traditionally our grant has been for new and expanding programs. So programs that were adding beds, adding capacity to the national landscape through a numbers uh, game, essentially. And this year, what we're doing is after looking at the data that Brittany, Brittany described, we're going to be opening to new and expanding programs as we traditionally have, but also to those programs that are addressing one of these barriers to care. And so Brittany, can you go to the next slide? In looking at 2021, last year, we had the opportunity to come alongside so many incredible new or expanding programs. These were programs that were either just opening their doors, adding a couple of beds, adding a um, whole other piece of programming, whether they were a transitional home that was adding LTC or a LTC that was adding transitional or et cetera. Or we had a couple of programs that we were able to help fund that had traditionally served adults and were also responding to needs for minors in their state. And I wanted to take a little bit of time because we as an organization run a little bit different with our um, applicants. We really believe in relationship building across this industry and that we are stronger together um, than we are apart. And so I wanted to take a little bit of time, as I know many of you will be turning in an application for the grant this year to talk to two of our grant recipients from last year that we've able to just really walk alongside and um, watch their incredible programs bloom and blossom and either open or get ready to open. And so with that, I am going to turn it over just real quick to, to Sylvia from PRISM Project to just talk a little bit about what that experience was like for her. Hi, thank you so much, Alia. Yeah, I'm Sylvia from the Prison Project. I'm the founder, executive director, and we are opening the first or first of our kind in, in Michigan for minors for restorative care. I actually met Christy about two and a half years ago, and she guided me to get a mentorship program with Wellspring to get a really good foundation in order to have your program up and running because 
as many of you are probably lost in the beginning, you have no idea. So it was just a great partnership to have. And then we were able to apply for a grant last year and we received money for salaries, which is huge because we were able to, with that money to, uh, hire a social worker, an assist, like an accountant, assistant director, a nursing or a supervisor for the direct care coaches and our program manager, because I needed help with all these people in place to be able to build the best program that I can. And it was the support and not only financial, but the resources. They were just recently being able to put me in touch with beds. So we are planning to open in the next two months. And so it would, it's amazing to be able to have the resources and support behind us. And we, like they said, they were able to give us six beds so we can open. So we're just at the tail end of finishing up construction and getting our licensing in order. And I'm super excited and I've been very fortunate for the partnership that I've had with the Safe House Project. Thank you, Sylvia. And we're really looking forward to Prism Project opening and getting being able to serve minor survivors from that community. And that is another thing that, that we're able to do. We have a community partner that is able to provide physical beds as well that for programs that are serving survivors in a residential setting. And that, so if anyone is in need of those kinds of services, a physical bed mattress, please let us know. And we'd be happy to make that connection for you as well. And then the second grantee that we're going to have jump on is going to be Rebecca. She is the communications coordinator for the Lampstand Home out of Virginia. Rebecca, are you there? I'm here. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. Perfect. Similar to Sylvia, we also got connected to the Safe House Project, I guess is the opposite way. We were referred to them through Wellspring Living in Atlanta, Georgia. We have been under their mentorship for years and have, we've really taken our time to open our safe home. And by the time we applied to the grant, the Safe House Project grant last year, we were on the brink of opening and we were just submitting all of our details of programming to our licensing agency through DSS. We are located here in Virginia in the Southwest area of Virginia and through the safe house project grant. And then another grant we received from the state, actually, we were able to open our doors last month in March, which has been just honestly a dream come true. We started a lamp stand back in 2013 with just really awareness and education in our community and expanded that to different wraparound services for victims and survivors. And we've been working towards opening the safe home and our safe home serves minor my, female minors ages 12 to 17 years old and our focus is that emergency piece and so our uh, program is a 90-day program so we're just so excited to now be serving survivors and our biggest need when we were applying to the, the grant last year was just funding the last little bit of the program and staffing needs the grant that we received from safe house project is now going towards our therapist which obviously was a huge need for our program and absolutely essential to what we do and so we were just really grateful to to have that need fulfilled and now be serving girls in our home. So I'm happy to answer any questions that people have about that process. And I think the one other thing I would add was even though we had really already knew what our program was going to include, it was really helpful just going through the application process and fine tune, tuning some of those just really minute details of how we were going to make sure that all of our services were trauma-informed and how we would receive and use just the different input that we have have gotten over the years from survivors into our program, into our physical building. And so it was just a good, I think, exercise, even thinking through what is the daily schedule for our participants in our program and, and the scheduling for our staff. So a uh, really helpful tool for us, even just the partnership of the different staff members at Safe House Project to help us with referrals and help us with fulfilling our, our different staff staffing needs. It's been amazing and we're so grateful to be working with y'all. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And I think that's something that's I've found to be really unique in this industry about our grant is that our relationships tend to continue and grow and go so far beyond just the funding piece. And I'm grateful to be able to review the applications that you all turn in every year and get to learn more about each of your programs. And so it's something that I look forward to too, as we continue this process, whether or not we end up getting to the end of it together, there's so many relationships that on our side, we've gotten to build through our application, through our grant application every year. 
and shifting into this year's grant. So as I said, the application will open on Sunday. If you have not yet filled out our letter of intent form for this year's grant, please do. That is going to be the easiest way for me to understand exactly who it is that is going to be looking for that grant for me to communicate with you and to get that application link to you on Sunday. I will be sending up a follow-up email that has this recording and some of these deadlines, and it will also have that LOI link if you have not had the chance yet to fill it out. You can do so what our grant cycle will look like. It will open May 1st and close July 15th. Our grant application should be able to be completed within um, an hour to two hours, if not less, if you're somebody that knows your program very well. Our application is a little bit different than maybe some of the other applications for funding that you might see see because our heart has always been to really understand the quality of programming that survivors are going to receive while they are uh, in program and to really fund those programs that are doing that high, high, giving that high level of care to the survivors that um, they're serving, which I know really is everyone that is on this call. And so I'm excited to get to review those. Selfishly, I'm excited to get to review those and see just the wonderful level of care that you're providing survivors. So after July 15th, we will review, we will start making the decisions internally as a team as to who will go on into the next piece of our process of the grant application, which will be those organization interviews. And um, those will be conducted over the summer and into September. We will announce the decisions on October in October and the funds will go out in November. So to qualify for this grant this year, you need to be a program serving survivors of sex trafficking uh, through some sort of housing component within your program. We also, our grant is to fund people in programs. It's not to fund buildings, brick and mortar buildings. So our funds are able to be used in, in a wide variety of ways other than purchasing the actual, renting the actual physical building. So they can go to staff salaries, to programmatic elements. There's lots of different ways that those funds can be used, but not for the brick and mortar buildings. Again, then the narrative that we need to see for the grant this year is one, that you are a program, and it can be any of these options, one being that if you are a program that is already existing, that is looking to add a number of beds, add capacity, um, that you are a new program that is looking to launch before, within one fiscal year by spring of 2023, and, or that you are an a program that is going to be using the funds to decrease a barrier to care from survivors entering your program or staying in your program. So those barriers to care being some of the ones that were highlighted by Brittany through the data today, there are a lot more barriers to care than what we could just cover in that short time that she had. And so if you're a program that is looking to, to add the ability to serve survivors with a higher level of need or of a, a different demographic, and the funds can be used that way. That's the narrative that we need to see through this. The programs that we fund also need to be a 501c3 in good standing. So you will have already needed to get your 501c3 status if you are a new program. And then with that, I am going to hand it back over um, to Christy. One, one last thing, I am the point of contact for the 2022 grant. So if my email is in the chat, so feel free to email me directly with any questions, call me, text me. I'm happy to answer any questions that come up before the grant cycle, during the grant cycle, after any program, any questions that you have about that, about placements or about our certification process, which is something separate. And that I know many of you are familiar with, please feel free to reach out to me directly. So we, I will now turn it over to um, Christy to just give you a, a real quick housekeeping item about. Awesome. Thank you, Alia. And again, thank you guys all for being on here today. One more thing that we do want to address. So Safe House Project obviously does everything in our power to get to raise funds and then give them out to you guys. But we also recognize that we are not the only funding source. And we want to try to open up opportunities for you guys to get funding that maybe you've never been able to access before. And we know that with that comes access to federal funds. I have been discouraged by how many of the programs that we work with that have said, I, I just, there's no way I can access federal funds because I'm a faith-based program or because I have this specific type of programming. And what we have found is that the 
after after care landscapes voice has really not been unified in a way that can in order to advise federal and state legislation to ensure that the practices uh, or the legislation that's being written is there to not only serve survivors but equip and certainly not immobilize organizations like you who are really working every day with these survivors and so we have been working with congressmen with a number of different members in the house and the senate on the federal side on the frederick douglas trafficking victims prevention and protection act of 2022 i'll go over that in a second but as we've been working on that there's actually been a call from congress to us to say hey we really need to unify this industry we really need to make sure that these that the voices of the aftercare landscape are heard and then on the flip side that Congress knows who you are so that as we run into barriers with legislation that is going to be really impactful for this industry that you all know so you and you guys are given the information so that you can mobilize as leaders in your community to reach out to your representatives and so as a result, we are formally launching the Trafficking Survivor Equity Coalition. And again, this is going to be really focused around unifying the aftercare and making sure that we are elevating survivor voices in the policy space so that they can accommodate for the benefits of restorative care or can advocate for the benefits of restorative care. We know we have our U.S. Survivor Advisory Council that does a phenomenal job advising on all elements of survivor-informed legislation, but we really want to make sure that we're elevating survivor voices in this aftercare space. We want to ensure that ultimately we're providing equitable and inclusive care to survivors and addressing systemic barriers to care and seeking policy solutions to address these gaps. And so Safe House Project, this is not another 20 hours of your week. Safe House Project will take the brunt of the work. We will work with legislators. We will be those point people, but we want to make sure that we have a group of aftercare partners that we are coming back and saying, hey, the federal federal government is trying to figure out how to spend $35 million in housing for trafficking victims, and they're using HUD. How do you think this can be done? What have you done that has been successful in order to advise properly on some of those federal initiatives? If this is something that you are interested in, you can email me, and we'll drop my email in the chat. Let me know. We will get you in on our next meeting. And um, we just had our first kickoff a couple of days. This is just really important. Your voice is important in this. Again, whether or not you receive federal dollars. On the next slide, just as one quick update to that, the Frederick Douglass Trafficking Victim Prevention and Protection Reauthorization Act of 2022. They could have made a shorter name, but it's amazing. This is the reauthorization of the original legislation in 2000 that made trafficking illegal. Every five years, Congress has to reauthorize this bill. This allows for them to bring in additional provisions around the prevention of trafficking, protection of victims, and prosecution of traffickers. It's also what reauthorizes federal funding for domestic and initial domestic and international initiatives to combat trafficking. And so currently, um, this bill was reintroduced in February after the um, second or the reauthorization that they were trying to get through just kept getting squashed. And so this is a slimmed down version of the bill that is being advocated for in the House of Representatives. The previous legislation is no longer intact. If you've heard about other organizations that have been working on this bill, if it's not HR 6552, it is an old piece of legislation that is no longer what Congress is looking at. This one is necessary to get a billion dollars in federal funding over the next five years for domestic and international initiatives to combat trafficking. We are hitting some delays because Normally one committee is only over a piece of legislation. In this case, there are six committees that have to sign off in order for this bill to even go to the floor for a vote. And so we are really working to mobilize your voices in this space to reach out to your legislators to say, hey, I just want you to know I'm very much in support of HR 6552. It is essential for our work to continue as an anti-trafficking movement. And there is a page on our website where you can get more information. If you would like to have the communications plan, if you wanna start communicating things out to your donor base board, however that looks through social media, through email, we've got pre-templatized language that you can use to make your life easy. So we are just asking for your help because this is essential in the work that we do to have the key piece of legislation around anti-trafficking continue to move forward and not get held up in congress so again if you would like to be part of the um, trafficking survivor equity coalition 
please reach out to me or Brittany and we will get you on that call. Um, if you have questions around the grant, reach out to Alia. And again, we are so grateful for each of you. We are here in this work because we love and adore you all. And we cheer on the work that you are doing on a daily basis. We are here to be a, a help and um, support. Blessings to all of you. And again, please let us know if we can be of any help. Have a great day.